the center is where we come to have that direct, immediate, unmediated experience of God, which is to say, the heart. Welcome to the Sufi Heart Podcast with Omid Safi, featuring teachings and stories from the wisdom of the Islamic tradition. Omid invites you to a meditation on the transformative power of love and recalling the necessity of healing our own hearts through healing the world. If you'd like to support Omid's podcast, please visit BeHereNowNetwork.com forward slash Omid. Hello, friends, and welcome back to the Sufi Heart Podcast. My name is Omid Safi, and today I've got something very special planned for us. It is a gentle introduction to the life of the famed South Asian Sufi and musical genius, Hazrat Anayat Khan. You know, so often in um, our discussion about Sufism, we focus on the lives and the teachings of classical Sufis, people like Rumi, who lived um, 700, 800, 1,000 years ago. But Hazrat Anayat Khan lives much closer to our own age. Uh, he was sent by his uh, spiritual guide uh, to the West to bring the message of love, harmony, and beauty, as it was called, uh, to Europe and North America. So in this short conversation, uh, I go over some of the salient features of Hazrat Anayat Khan's teachings and also explore the connections that it has to the Sufi tradition that shaped him. Uh, we're going to start our deep dive with that question of when you feel distant from God, how how do you return? How do you resume that connection of intimacy, of love, of affection? And this is a this is an exploration. This is a question that Hazrat Anayat Khan, a young Hazrat Anayat Khan, had to undertake. So join us and let's go through the path of love in such a sweet and recent manifestation. Thank you so very, very much, dear Miraj, and uh, uh, hello and greetings, and uh, salam alaikum, shalom alaikum to all the different friends who are joining us. Thank you for taking this time. The gift that people offer you of sharing their time is one of the most gracious things that anyone can ever bring to a gathering. And uh, I'm especially delighted to be included in this conversation um, that can serve as both an introduction and also, inshallah, a deepening of our journey. Um, what I hope to do in the time that we have today is to share a few insights about a particular approach in the Sufi tradition that sometimes is referred to as the path of love, or to use language that I prefer, uh, the path of radical love. Now, love is both universal, uh, I don't know of a tradition that doesn't speak about love, aspire to it, 
at some level. Uh, and then it's a little bit like water that is flowing in different rivers and different oceans. It's when that water takes on the characteristic and the quality of different places that we come to call it by different names. It's all water. But here we might know it as the Nile, and there we might call it Mississippi, and there the Indian Ocean, and there the Atlantic. Sometimes water might spring up from under your feet, and sometimes it might shower down upon you. But the thing about water is that it's the same water everywhere. And how lovely it is when you start to recognize that even though over here we call it the Atlantic and there the Pacific, the oceans all connect. They take on a shape, they have their own qualities, but they're also intertwined and connected. And that's a beautiful metaphor for the life of the spirit. So these are two aspects that I'm going to ask us to keep with us as we go through our journey. In our NIT tradition, with the beautiful symbol of the two wings and the heart. I love this metaphor that it takes two wings to soar. It's a more fruitful metaphor than when people speak about on one hand and on the other hand. Usually when they say that, they're talking about two things that are somewhat intention with one another, whereas with wings, you need both wings. And without the wings, it's a little challenging to soar. The two wings harmonize. They complement rather than be intention. So these are the two wings that we want to be holding in balance together. That when we speak about the Sufi tradition, and in particular, the path of love, what we call the mazhab e um, if we are speaking in a historical context, if we're speaking about the figures, the illuminated beings, and even many of the practices that are engaged in, well, sure, those come out of a particular trajectory from the Islamic tradition. As Hazrat Anayat Khan says, uh, Islam as a religion was revealed in Arabia Intellectually, it matured in Persia, and spiritually, it reached a zenith in India. To that extent, sure, when we speak about some of the great Sufis that I hope we'll get to speak about today, Rabia extraordinary female mystic. Rumi, that falcon of God's own love. Ibn Arabi, that unparalleled master of harmonizing the oneness of God with the apparent manyness of creation. Um, these are all figures who clearly and unambiguously 
participated in the Islamic tradition. And with the other wing, <laughs> uh, it's like a tree that has grown out of a particular soil, but has created this vast canopy that offers shade and fruit to people far, far beyond where its own roots and trunk are. Sometimes when we read the works of Hazrat Anayat Khan, we see the ways in which he speaks about the mystical life as that metaphor of climbing a mountain, that the higher you go, the more vast your vista becomes. That metaphor is one that we find so beautiful in much of the Sufi tradition going back a thousand years before the time of Hazrat Anayit Khan. Rumi uses the image of a pilgrimage. If I were to just take a moment and look across our beautiful little gallery view, I see lots of friends, a few of whom I know, many of whom are new to me. And if we were to take a look at where our friends are situated, well, you know, I know I'm sitting in my home in the state of North Carolina. I think I see a few friends from the West Coast. Wouldn't surprise me if we have some friends joining us from across the ocean. And somehow we've all come together in this virtual rabbit hole known as Zoom for an hour and 15 minutes of conversation about God and humanity and how love is the way that we got here and the way that we're going to go home. Today, we might think of people clicking away from many different locations. Rumi used the metaphor of a physical pilgrimage. He said, if you're going to Mecca, to one of those places where the house of God is, some people might come from Palestine and Syria, and that's pretty much a straight shot down. Some people might have come from China, come all the way from the east. And some may have come from Spain and Morocco, all the way from the west. And so he says, if you look at the paths, the paths might appear to be not only different, but even contradictory. But you got to look to see where they're meeting. You got to see where they are heading. And that's one of the starting points of the Sufi path of love. Uh, they talk about our existence as being something like a circle of which God, the one, the absolute, the only, the all, is the center of a circle. And we, humanity, creation, are the points along the circumference. We have to find our way back to the center. And the center is not a building, it's not a nation, it's not a city, 
the center is where we come to have that direct, immediate, unmediated experience of God, which is to say, the heart. So how do we do this? How do we come to be with the one who's always with us? How do we rectify the reality that God is always with us, but occasionally we might feel like we are not with God or scattered? distracted. And these days, uh, it's probably easier than ever to be distracted. How often have you had this experience of you're sitting on a couch or laying on a bed and you grab your phone for a second and you start scrolling. The next thing you know, an hour has gone by you are no wiser, no kinder, no gentler. And here's the one thing that never happens after an hour on Instagram. Instagram never tells you, that's it, Omid. You read them all. You saw all the posts. There's no more. You got me. It's just this endless, bottomless pit of distraction. Are we doomed to live like that? Do we have an alternative? And the good news is we do. And the alternative is as close as the heart and as immediate as the breath. So let's start with Hazrat Nayat Khan, a person that brings so many of us together, but before he becomes Piro Morshid Hazrat Nayat Khan, before he becomes this luminous being that in less than five decades of life manages to unite the East and the West with the gift of his music and his spiritual teaching. Sometimes it's fun to think about what was Hazrat Nayat Khan like as a teenager? For that matter, do you ever notice that if you read the Bible, you get stories about Jesus' birth and then it like jumps. Like you hear almost nothing about Jesus, the teenager. For, for good reason. The same is true of many spiritual teachers. We have the stories of their birth and childhood. And then they become Muhammad. And then they become Jesus. And then they become the Buddha. But what were they like as that? Stop for Allah, stop for Allah, potentially whiny teenager, full of angst and doubt, not quite yet fully realized. Were they always fully realized? Maybe. Maybe not. So here's one episode that we know, and I'm going to show you a couple of images as we go along. Can you all see this beautiful image of Morshid? Yeah, wonderful. So we, we're told that when Morshid was quite, well, not yet Morshid, at that point, just an ayat. When he was quite young, he started to have some really important doubts about his spiritual unfolding. He wanted to know, how could he really experience God? Why didn't he feel the presence of God always? 
And so he goes to his sheikh, to his teacher, Abu Hashem Madani. And he shares this concern. And his teacher offers him a gift, which is that he reads for him one verse of the Quran. Sanurihim ayatina fil afaq wa fi anfusahim hatta yatabayyana lahum innahu al So this is put in that royal we language of the divine. We will show you our signs, our manifestations in three places. That word aya, it's a sign of God. It's um, such a beautiful concept that my... Um, Sweet, mischievous three year old toddler is named Aya. She might at some point burst into my room. We hope she's properly clothed when she does so. And she herself is a sign of God. And that word Aya is also what we use to refer to each verse of the Quran. And by extension, all the scriptures, all the sacred scriptures. Sure, we can learn something about God by reading scripture, by extension, literature, music. We'll show you our signs in the scripture. Fill off on the furthest horizons in nature. In nature, uh, Pirzia, our beautiful teacher, has this wonderful saying, the reason that when you go for a walk in the woods or by an ocean or in the desert and you feel refreshed is because you are reminded that you're not so much going into nature that you yourself are nature. And the nature in you delights in the nature out there. In some ways, the Sufi tradition is a natural path. It's the way of nature. When we read the lives of early, early Sufis, many of whom had rich traditions of meditation, contemplation, prayer, they generally did not go inside buildings for this meditation. They went out into wide open spaces. They went up on a mountaintop or by an ocean or into the desert. Anytime that the natural cosmos was experienced as a sacred manifestation of God. That was an occasion for deepening one's spiritual life. We will show you our signs in scripture, in nature, and the way that this path becomes also the path of the inner life is in the third part. Wafi and Fusahim, and inside your own souls. In you. Yes, you have to look for God in the revealed scriptures. Yes, we have to look for the divine out there 
in that majestic and beautiful nature. And then your sight has to return towards yourself, towards humanity, and to see God within. It's when we come to experience the divine as both within and without, revealed and experienced, that the heart can grow its wings and we can take to flight. We will show you our signs in scripture, in nature, and inside your own souls until it becomes clear to you that God is the real. God is Haq. Only God is real. It is the heart that uniquely is capable of serving as a receptacle for the divine. That's why if you look at that beautiful symbol of the heart and wings, and in the heart you see a star and a crescent, and the moon doesn't have light of its own, but when it receives the light of the sun, there may not be anything more beautiful in the night sky. Hmm? So it is with these illuminated beings. Sometimes you look at a picture of Murshid, like the one here. And it's hard to take your eyes off of him. You didn't know that people could become in such a beauty. Murshid describes the impact of hearing that teaching from his mentor. We will show you our signs in scripture, in the revealed traditions, out in nature, and within your own souls until it becomes clear to you that God is the real. He describes this as enlivening his heart bringing a measure of certainty and light to him of an assurance that this is the path that comes from God and leads us to God. His experience of this verse of the Quran is a beautiful example of the ways in which the particularity of a tradition and a vast open expansiveness, universality of it, come together. The Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, had said at one point that in an intimate conversation with God, God had revealed to him, the heavens and the earth cannot contain me, but the heart of my loving devotee suffices me. We want a big God. We deserve 
a big God. We don't want a God who is limited by one nation, one race, one gender, one understanding. No, we deserve a God that is grander than the infinite universes. It's almost unfathomable. If you take all the grains of sand in all the deserts of the world and made each one of them a galaxy, there are still more galaxies out there. Our, our human minds cannot even fathom that. And then within all of this expansiveness, sometimes we have the arrogance to think that God is, among all these infinite galaxies, uniquely on the side of this people or that people. That's a small God. That's a puny God. That's a tiny God. And we deserve a grand divine. Two wings and one heart. If God is merely grand, transcendent, beyond, well, how do I get to love the one who is so beyond? God is also the near the intimate. The heavens and the earth cannot contain me, but the heart of my loving devotee suffices me. So Peter Morshet says at one point, the real abode of God is in the heart of mankind. There is this intimate connection between God, today we would say humanity, God and humanity. And if our hearts are closed to a portion of humanity, it also means that it is partially closed to God. So Hazrat Naid Khan goes on to say, the real abode of God is in the heart of mankind. When it is frozen with bitterness or hatred, the doors of the shrine are closed. The light is hidden. The light is hidden. So part of our task is to keep this heart open open to all the different paths, open to the whole of humanity. And in doing so, we're picking up on some of the teachings that we've always had in the classical Sufi tradition. Ibn Arabi, that exquisite mystic of Spain, the Muslim genius who spent half of his life in the West and half of his life in the East he has a visionary encounter of experiencing his heart as a garden that is engulfed in flames. This is what he composes. Uh, keep track of all the different divine paths that he names here. What wonder is this? A garden among the flames. My heart takes on every form. A pasture for gazelles, nature. A cloister for monks the idol's temple, a Kaaba for the circling pilgrim, the Torah's 
tables and the Quran's pages. I follow the religion of love. Whichever way this caravan turns, I turn. This love is my religion, this my faith. Now, Hazrat Anayit Khan has grown up with these teachings. He's grown up in a context where the notion of experiencing the divine in these myriad forms, in these multiple paths, has been a part of his upbringing. He's also a sweet fruit of the salvation tradition, which is, if not the most, among the most religiously, ethnically, linguistically, pluralistic places on earth. 700 languages. And one of those places where it was not at all uncommon for a Muslim musician to have a Hindu disciple whom they would mentor and love and nourish. And then when that Hindu disciple becomes a master in his or her own right, that they would in turn take on another disciple of another tradition. And we know this from the historical accounts that the Chishti tradition, that beautiful path of love tradition in South Asia was one that included people of different faith backgrounds. It's different than what we find in Egypt or in Morocco or in many other places where in order to join a Sufi community, conversion to Islam was expected. It happened um, gradually. But not so in India. India has its own flavor. And when Pir Morshid comes to the West, when he is sent to the West, in the words of his mentor, his sheikh, to unite the East and the West with the gift of his music, he finds himself in a context in which the only Muslims that are around are the descendants of enslaved Africans. About 20% of African-descended people, enslaved folk, had come from Muslim backgrounds. And their religion, their language, their culture, almost everything was stripped of them. Morshet finds himself in a context of Christians and Jews, mostly, and he has a gift to offer. He taps into that rich South Asian tradition of sharing the Sufi tradition with everyone. We'll show you our signs in scripture, in nature, and inside yourself. That word for self is somewhat of a cognate in the Sufi tradition for breath. Nafs and nafas. Nefesh in Hebrew. The breath becomes a quintessential aspect of the Sufi tradition had already been so in India and continues to be so here in the West.
if what we're trying to get away from is endless doom scrolling, multitasking, <laughs> it's pretty amusing that people talk about multitasking. I'm not even sure that we have a word for single tasking. But when we come back to the breath, that's where God is. And that's where we can be fully present. As the Tanayat Khan brings the teachings of the Chishti tradition, Reminding us that yes, God is more vast than an ocean, but God is closer to you than the ocean is to the fish. God is closer to you than the ocean is to the fish. Uh, some of you have been joining us in these classes that um, we've been exploring and journeying through the divine names, many of them come in pairs, the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the inward and the manifest, the one that elevates you and the one that brings humility. Many of these occur in pairs, and when they don't, that's interesting and worthy of attention. So in the Sufi tradition that gives birth to Hajrat Naid Khan, the near, Al-Qarib, is a name of God. It's one of the divine qualities. The near. In fact, in the Quran, the most near, Aqra. The near is a divine quality. The far is not a divine name. God is only near. God is always near. God has always been near. Never far. Here is one of the most influential and beloved of the Sufi mystics, Rabia. Rabia, who's always remembered as running through the town with a lit torch in one hand and a bucket of water vase in the other. Right? It's a strange image. It's the juxtaposition of opposites, as the great Sufi Abu Sayyid Kharraz said, when opposite meet, that's where you find God. And so people look at her and say, Rabia, what are you doing? And she answers, uh, I'm going to find heaven. I'm going to burn it down. I'm going to find hell. And I'm going to quench it with this water so that people have no reason left to worship God other than God. So this is the path of love, which is no longer about getting into heaven. The path of love that's not about avoiding hellfire. It is the singular focus on God as the beloved. The one. Hazrat Naid Khan says at one point, I searched and searched and searched, and I could not find thee anywhere. I called thee aloud, standing on the minaret. I rang the temple bell, 
with the rising and setting of the sun, I bathed in the Ganges in vain. I came back from Kaaba disappointed. I looked for thee in heaven, my beloved, my pearl. But at last I have found thee hidden in the shell of my heart. Part of what Hazrat Naid Khan is teaching us here is, of course, not to do away with revealed religion. We would be fools to dispense with that accumulated wisdom and insight of millennia of prophets and prophetesses, mystics and sages, lovers and dreamers. But we also know that the encounter with the divine is not inheritance. Two wings, one heart. We cannot soar to God without the wings of our ancestors. We need them. We need their insight. We need their teachings. We need their blessing and their prayers. But we can also not soar to God only on the wings of our ancestors. We have to learn to unfurl our own wings because we were born with wings. We were meant to soar. Here, there is a daylight between ordinary conventional religion and the path of the mystic. The difference is when someone stands in front of you with a bowl of honey in their hand and they dip their finger in it and they put it in their own mouth and they say, mm -mm, mm -mm, mm -mm. I do declare this is some good honey. I'm from the South, can you tell? And much of what ordinary religion looks like is the whole congregation standing up and declaring, I do declare that that person standing in front took his finger and he dipped his finger in his bowl of honey and he put it in his mouth and he said, mm -mm, mm -mm, mm. I do declare it's so sweet. I testify that he did that. But the path of love is to go further. That here and now, to remember that we have our own wings and you have your own bowl of honey and to dip your own finger in your own bowl of honey and to put it in your own mouth and taste that sweetness And when you do so, when you're tasting, then the mouth is closed and there's no more need to speak. And that's where we're going to stop. goal is to unfurl your own wings, to discover our own bowl of honey, to put it 
in our own mouth and to taste that sweetness. Söyleyman, kuş bir gün, bir gün